So, good morning. My name is Brad Chambers. I want to welcome you to track three, panel one on housing. I'm from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. I actually run the middle market effort, which is in the commercial banking space for the firm. And sitting next to me is my colleague, Josh Gross, who actually is our primary head for covering the San Fernando Valley. I'd also uh, like to uh, introduce and recognize um, our uh, co-sponsor for this, Sapphire Construction and Development, and also our track sponsors, Metro and Parsons. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to Housing Breaking Ground panel. I get the honor of introducing our moderator and panel today, Joe Bernstein, Vice President, Director and Development of Sapphire Construction. The biographies of each of the panelists have already been provided for you in the journal, so we're just going to keep it relatively straightforward. But I'd like to point to California State Assemblyman Raul Bocanegra, Jennifer Hernandez, a partner of Holland and Knight, Megan Kirkaby, Policy Research Specialist for the California Department of Housing and Community Development, and Dr. Nick Morantz, Assistant Professor at UC Irvine. Unfortunately, maybe some of you have uh, determined that uh, there's been somewhat of a change in the speaker set with Five Point, had to cancel last minute due to a family emergency. And I'd like to say thank you for participating in today's panel. Turn it to you, Joe. Thanks, Brad. Um, I've really been looking forward to uh, moderating today's housing panel and hearing what our stellar panelists have to say. And also, I did uh, get clearance from VICA President Kevin Tamaki uh, to say, go Dodgers. <laughs> All right. So before we start, a little housekeeping. Um, at your seat, there's an exit survey for the panel, and I encourage you to please fill it out at the end of the session and return it to VICA staff or an intern or a VICA ambassador. Um, and they're right over here. Wave, please. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Or you can turn it in at the registration booth uh, in the foyer. Uh, VICA uh, needs your feedback in order to prepare for next year's event, so please take a minute to fill it out and turn it in. Thank you. So, most of us in this room are working to build housing in the midst of a housing crisis. Many of us are breaking ground, but it just keeps getting harder. So, we've got a great panel uh, to discuss what is being done and what can be done. So, to get things started, I am going to give each of our panelists a couple of minutes to make an opening statement. Then I'm going to ask each of them a question, and then we'll open it up uh, from, uh, uh, for questions from, uh, from all of you. So uh, let's start. Um, Assemblyman Bocanegra, would you like to just make a brief statement? Sure. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Vika for the uh, invitation. Happy to be here and be part of this panel discussion. Uh, and with you all, and I look forward to um, the ideas and the input and maybe the feedback of what we've done this last legislative year in Sacramento. And I think from the outset of what I want to say is by no means do I think that um, what we did this last uh, eight or nine months is going to fix the problem. I think it's just the beginning. Uh, and um, I think it's also something to celebrate that for the first time since I've been a watcher of politics at the local government and at state government that we're finally having the kind of attention that we need to address the housing crisis and challenge. And as somebody that spent uh, 16 years in local government as a staffer, um, I think I have a perspective, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing further thoughts as to uh, what we can do beyond the uh, recording fee for a dedicated housing, uh, affordable housing trust fund that was created, or SB3, the, uh, the housing bond of $4 billion that will be on the ballot next year, and the CEQA streamlining bill that Scott Weiner from San Francisco was able to uh, put through with, with some compromise, and sometimes politics is the art of compromise in terms of what it's doing, and some of my bills that look to the Housing Accountability Act and strengthening the um, putting some teeth in enforcement when local jurisdictions don't do the uh, right thing according to their general plans and their uh, zoning documents. So I'm happy to be here and looking forward to be part of uh, the debate. 
Hi, um, so uh, my license plate is Sequin Nerd, um, and uh, I have made uh, uh, quite a good living for 30 some years now working with the California Environmental Quality Act on projects up and down the state for uh, government, uh, uh, private, and uh, nonprofit sector uh, clients. It is my particular passion um, uh, to focus on what is being called the missing middle. Um, if you think about a kind of champagne glass, nice shallow bowl, stem, and then a, a little base, that's pretty much our housing production story. Um, about 96% of housing units built over the last several years have been aimed at people with 200% or more of the average median income, the champagne glass. Then there's the middle, it's the longest part of the glass, there's nothing going on. And then there's affordable. And this year's uh, session of the legislature, which has focused on what's traditionally been between four and five percent of our housing stock, subsidized, deed restricted, affordable units are four to five percent of California's housing stock. This last year really put some much needed funding back into that affordable sector. And, uh, and I think the legislature and governor should be congratulated for attending to that, uh, which was um, pretty much decimated after the end of redevelopment agencies. But that missing middle, that's what most people need. The space between 80% and about 200% of average median income. We will never have enough money to put into second theme the cost of building the units that we're building today no matter how many bond measures, no matter how much our tax rate is, for the literally millions of households that are earning between 60 and $80,000 a year. We simply can't afford it. And I'm gonna just let you know how bad is the cost part of the housing crisis right now. Uh, San Francisco just approved an, an all affordable um, 234 unit project that penciled out all in cost at $920,000 per unit. Average size less than 800 square feet. So there's gonna be 234 people or families who win a lottery, and then there's everybody else. So for me, I'd like to focus on the missing middle. Thank you, Megan. Great, thanks, Vika, for hosting us. Um, it's an exciting and sobering time to be talking about housing. Um, my heart goes out to all those who are facing the affordable housing crisis, uh, as well as those um, facing the recent fires uh, who have been displaced. And uh, while the count is still ongoing, um, we could be looking at having lost 7,000 homes in this last round of fires. Um, in January, uh, HCD, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, we released a statewide housing assessment looking at some of the housing challenges facing California. Um, you're gonna hear it a lot today, but we are under building housing. Uh, even before we start, we've, these units we've lost, we've been, had a very low of, uh, supply of new homes. We've only averaged less than 80,000 new homes every year in the past 10 years. Uh, we need about 180,000 new homes just to keep up with new family growth, with having kids, with some new immigration, even though immigration is down to California. Um, so that's a big gap between what we need just to keep up with our household growth and what we're building. Um, we're also not, uh, while we need more homes everywhere in the state, where we are seeing homes is often further from jobs, uh, further from transportation, uh, and uh, leading to longer commutes, diminishing quality of life, we also have uh, a third of our renter households, 1.7 million renter households, paying more than half of their income every month in rent. Uh, when you're paying more than half of your income every month in rent, you can imagine uh, that makes you really vulnerable to shocks. Um, a broken down car uh, could move somebody into homelessness. Uh, that you certainly are also having trouble saving for things like a down payment, let alone emergencies. And we also have the largest homeless population in the country. 
Uh, we have 22% of the nation's homeless population, but only 12% of the population overall. overall. Um, so that's the dim part of my story, I'm so sorry. Um, but <laughs> uh, thanks to um, the assembly member and his colleagues this year, uh, we do have some new tools in the toolbox um, uh, with 15 housing package bills. Um, and as the assembly member alluded to, um, some of you might see some of these as compromises, but I urge you to see these as hard-won battles, that this is 15 bills that come together to have affordable housing funding um, for, uh, for low-income households and middle-income households, uh, local incentives, streamlining of approvals, um, accountability and uh, enforcement. I think a lot of those those bills, the Housing Accountability Act, those might not be things you're familiar with on a daily basis, but we have a lot of great housing laws in California that haven't uh, had enforcement behind them. Uh, I think sometimes we like to say, oh, we need new housing laws, but a lot of our housing laws work very well but need enforcement mechanisms, and I think a lot of work this year went into um, putting some teeth behind that uh, to give development and supply a chance at success. Thank you, Nick. Yes, I want to thank you for inviting me today. Uh, this is a fascinating and very important topic at this point in California's history. Um, as several speakers during the breakfast panel mentioned, there are, are sort of two sets of problems in California. There are the problems of economic stagnation uh, in inland California, and then the problems confronting coastal California, of which the housing crisis is probably right at the top of the list. Um, I'd like to suggest that uh, the way that Californians and California governments think about planning for housing is extremely convoluted. Uh, and uh, I hope that this new set of housing bills that comes out of the legislature can address that. At the same time, uh, the uh, the connection between proposing a development project and getting it built gets increasingly and increasingly attenuated. And uh, I, I would like to discuss today some of the ways that we might make that more of a direct line. Um, and I recently wrote an op-ed in the LA Times suggesting that one way to do that would be to uh, ask municipalities to accommodate a fair share of low and moderate income housing, and then if they fail to do that, to allow developers to effectively request the state for an override of local zoning if a project includes a specified share of low and moderate income housing. Uh, that seems to some people like an extreme remedy. To other people, it seems like common sense. Um, and. Uh, the reactions have been enlightening and interesting, and uh, it's the sort of strong solution that I think needs to be at least on the table when we're talking about a housing crisis of the magnitude that uh, the statistics that Megan presented suggest. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, let, let's stick with you. Um, our, our first question um, for you is, um, families are leaving LA because they can't afford to pay rent and developers are investing elsewhere because of ever rising fees and costs. How can LA balance the need to increase overall supply with the need to increase affordability? So I mean the, sh the short answer to this question is allow more housing to be built. <laughs> uh, there's no inherent tension between increasing supply and improving affordability. There is a subset of households that will always need help in paying for their housing. Uh, and that uh, is, is something that the city recognizes, the state recognizes, that requires funding. What doesn't necessarily require more funding is what Jennifer was talking about, the missing middle. Uh, that is pretty much a, a matter of supply. Um, and so the, the issue is, is the city of Los Angeles going to permit more projects to be built? Um, I think embedded in this question 
was uh, a question about the linkage fee that the city will be imposing on new development projects. Um, you know, a linkage fee is a tax on development. Generally, when you tax something, you get less of it. Um, at the same time, there is not enough funding to provide housing that is affordable at 30% of household income for all of the households in LA County. And, this, and now I'm just talking about the households that will always need some public support. And so in one of the problems that we confront when we talk about zoning reform or anything is uh, the constraints on local government finance in California. The linkage fee is one way to get around that. Um, and the question is how much of an impact on supply, on overall supply will it have? And that's not a question that I have an answer to. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> OK. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's great stuff. Um, next question um, is for Jennifer. And that is, um, what are the toughest challenges to getting a residential project built in LA today? And what are the top two politically realistic changes, either policy, legal, or CEQA, that would ease some of the barriers to development? Um, well, thanks. So um, I, I uh, want to share with you some real nerdy stuff. So it turns out when you file a CEQA lawsuit, you have to give a copy of that to the California Attorney General's office. So in two tranches of three years each, we got from a Public Records Act request all CEQA lawsuits filed statewide. In our first study of the three years 2010 to 2012, just edging past the recession, we found that housing projects were targeted by about 24% of CEQA uh, uh, lawsuits and about 80% of CEQA lawsuits were aimed at projects of all kinds in existing communities. In the second three-year study, which we've just completed, we broke the data down by region, and it's pretty stunning. 33% of all CEQA lawsuits filed in the SCAG region aim at housing. 98% of those housing units are in infill locations. 70% of the challenged housing units are within the half-mile transit corridors and transit nodes that SCAG has identified. And then, and this is a particular beef for me, Hernandez is my name, not my husband's, the idea that CEQA is protective of minority communities, 78% of CEQA lawsuits are filed outside what Cal EPA has mapped as environmental justice communities. CEQA lawsuits against housing are filed disproportionately in wider, wealthier, and healthier areas of this region and elsewhere, we believe, in California, but we have the map data for the SCAG region, thanks to SCAG. If this law had anything other than environment in its name, we would have blown it up years ago. This is not about the natural environment, and it's not about public safety. It's become quite a potent tool for reasons that are stunning as leverage. There isn't another environmental law in the country that you can sue under anonymously or openly for economic gain. This one does. You have an almost 50% chance of winning a CEQA lawsuit based on published appellate court data. Imagine what the tax system would look like if you won against the IRA half the time. It is intentionally chaotic and maintained in a chaotic system, according to the governor, in order to protect labor unions who want project labor agreements as a tool. We're a Favel CIO. I'm the daughter and granddaughter of steel workers in Pittsburgh, California. The harmed parties here are union workers. They work hard. They do not earn 200% of median income. This gimmick, this lawyer gimmick of CEQA lawsuits its time has come. It will only be reformed at the ballot box. And we're working with a remarkable coalition of unions, YIMBYs, millennials, our most indebted nation in history, and civil rights leaders 
who watched equity from minority communities evaporate during the Great Recession. Years, generations of hard-won gains to get access to federally insured home loans, to beat discriminatory practices, to actually establish a foothold on the middle class with home ownership, wiped out. And now, in the name, believe it or not, of climate, people are openly talking about simply not doing home ownership in the future about actually, this is a paper by Carol Galante, former HCD uh, director for uh, uh, President Obama and former head of Bridge, and Ethan Elkin, a professor at Bolt, openly talking about demolishing tens and possibly hundreds of thousands of single family homes in order to build quadruplexes, triplexes, and create more compact forms of development. Whose homes do you think those are gonna be? People are talking about charging for every vehicle miles traveled. Who is forced to drive the farthest? Construction workers, Stanford study. Or get everyone on public transit. University of Minnesota, 7% of this region's jobs are accessible in a 60 minute tr public transit ride today. The truth is, I think, we just need to calm down and focus what's in front of us. Right now we have a crisis of homelessness a crisis of poverty, and a crisis of housing. And there's too much we have in common once we talk to each other and maybe kick people like me, the lawyers, out of the room. We just have to come up with solutions. I do think CEQA reform is possible. But apart from CEQA reform at the ballot box, the reform that uh, the assemblyman talked about was a trade requiring prevailing wage for projects that could possibly work through this labyrinth of conditions that they have, have to also meet. Prevailing wage projects for residential construction uh, increase the labor component of project costs by between two and three. So we are already at a, an affordability crisis. And that's actually the, the last thing I want to talk about. Everyone has felt like the guys not in the room, the future renters, the future homeowners, they'll just pay because they're not in the room to say otherwise. So we load up fees taxes. Every time we require an inclusionary unit in a 10 unit project, the cost of that inclusionary unit is borne by the other nine units. It's not borne by us. It's not borne by homeowners. It's not borne by older people generally. We have a generational situation on our hands and we have this fiction that we can keep loading costs onto new housing projects. And it's just not true. People will make money, developers want to make money, I can tell you. They will build whatever they can afford to make money on. Right now, all the policy goals are slanted toward the highest end housing because we have cities charging fees of more than $100,000 a door. My last point, the city of Los Angeles and the region as a whole is uniquely targeted by sequel lawsuits. This region gets two times more sequel lawsuits than the next highest region in San Francisco. More than 200 over the last three years. 14,000 housing units were challenged. 14,000. I don't think we have to put up with that. And shining a bright light on this, and it is a lawyer trick, by the way, is my way of attempting to uh, achieve the political reform that I think is possible with the Democratic majority. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, okay, next question is for Megan. Uh, what are the top two changes you would make at the city, county, or state level to increase the number of affordable projects that actually get built? Uh, well, I think, the, I think the number one thing that the state being, speaking about my department and looking inward can do is to work towards implementing this, this package of 15 bills and make sure that they roll out in an effective way and that they get to work immediately trying to do some of what Jennifer is talking about to, for, uh, for the projects that fit to get streamlining, uh, to make approvals easier for affordable housing projects that are often denied, especially in areas of opportunity um, and uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. Uh, to look at uh, ways that we can um, be supportive in 
uh, rolling out planning grants for local governments so that they can relook at their permitting process, so that they can relook um, at the way that they approve projects and the way they zone and work towards um, a more streamlined development process. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that didn't happen in this session in terms of a bill, but happened in terms of uh, a research project is in, uh, is the state is directed to go take a look at fees, to go take a look at the way that um, fees are done at a local level and to make some recommendations in the following year. Um, and I think um, some of you may be familiar with this, but in the last legislative session, there was an accessory dwelling unit piece of legislation that um, looked at uh, how we do approvals for people who want to add a second unit in their backyard. Uh, and fees were one of the things that were examined in that bill. Uh, that maybe an accessory dwelling unit that's 500 square feet shouldn't pay the same municipal fees as a 5,000 square foot um, home in the same community. Uh, and I think there are gonna be conversations like that about how fee structures happen and um, how fees are, you know, a lot of policy goals are done through housing and uh, which ones of those, what, what effect are those having? Um, I think the, the state takes a nuanced view of that, but I think we want to do understand more of what's going on. And then I would just say at the local level, I think it's taking advantage of um, the funding that is going to come out of this housing package. Um, a lot of the local ho the housing trust fund that was created through the document recording fee is going to go back to local governments. Um, and then there's also going to be um, early money for planning. So taking advantage of that planning, there's gonna be money for technical assistance. So taking advantage of all the resources that are at uh, city or county's disposal to um, get ready to, to figure out what kind of community they wanna see and be doing less project by project analysis and um, being able to say yes to things that fit within their community plan. Great. Thank you. Um, so we've got one last question for Assemblymember Bocanegra, and um, after that we're gonna open it up to questions from the room, and I also, um, with this question, then wanna encourage uh, the panelists as well to kind of turn this a little bit into a conversation and feel free to, to, to respond uh, to each other. So with that, the uh, question is Los Angeles desperately needs affordable housing, but some local officials have shown reluctance to make decisions that will address the issue. State officials have stepped in and passed a package of housing bills that have been signed by Governor Brown. Uh, can you talk about any bills that may be on the horizon for 2018 that will deliver more housing for Angelinos? Sure. Um, first of all, this has been great. I really like the, um, the ideas here and look forward to the uh, questions from the audience. To, to be quite frank, so I'm a member of the Assembly State Housing Committee um, and I believe I'm the only Angelina who sits on the committee from LA County. There's another gentleman from the San Gabriel Valley. And to put it uh, politely, I, I guess if someone were to characterize my political leanings, I'm a little bit of a jobs Democrat, more of a centrist. People use the word moderate, but I'm not a big fan of that name anymore. Um, let's just say that I'm a Clinton type of Democrat. But all, but all the, the good stuff about Bill Clinton, right? <laughs> um, jobs. Bill, Bill jo jo jobs in the economy. Um, and most of the bills that got out of the Assembly's Housing Committee were pragmatic bills. Some of them were tough. I don't like voting for taxes. I don't like voting for things that are going to put an extra cost on um, people. But uh, the SP2, the recording fee, did get out with a lot of support. One bill that did not get out, uh, it got out, but it's stuck on the floor because it's a two-thirds vote, and it requires 54 Democrats to vote for it. And, you know, we're not all the same. A Bakersfield Democrat is much different than a Democrat from Santa Monica, than a Democrat from Pacoima. But uh, the mortgage interest deduction on second homes uh, and, you know, taking that tax credit away and putting it to the TCAC program 
which uh, would leverage more funds. That was a bill chaired by that, uh, that was authored by the chair of the Housing Committee, David Chu, who is from San Francisco. And San Francisco is much different than Los Angeles, right? So I, I believe that that one is still out there, and I think that's gonna, that that's already having some discussion as to you know, whether or not that be some things that more centrist leaning Democrats could support on the floor. Um, the other one that I've already been bombarded with, because my personal assembly inbox is now full from people throughout California, namely from Northern California and Santa Monica, with repealing the Costa Hawkins Act, right? So, um, and that's something that I got a heads up from our chairman that, you know, hey, Raul, you have to understand, being from San Francisco, I got to be for this, right? And the bill is still stuck in housing. And I'm not sure if there's the votes there, you know, but quite frankly, that is something that I believe is going to have some uh, talk. And uh, we're having an informational hearing on Tuesday, and repealing Costa Hawkins is part of the ad agenda. And uh, you know, for someone like myself, expanding rent control, I, I think it's worthy of discussion. I'm not sure how it really works out in the marketplace. I would look to some of our folks here to hear their thoughts on it. But uh, I mean, I'm, I, I've got over up to a thousand emails just in one day from people. So it's a campaign already. And I think folks just want to put everything on the wall and see what sticks. And like I said, I think there's a lot to be proud about what we did with these 15 bills. By, now, by no means do I think that we're done. I think we're going to have a continued focus. But quite frankly, I think for myself and some of the other more centrist leaning Democrats in my caucus, we're looking for things that are not going to disrupt the market so, you know, so much. We did do a bill that was a little bit controversial for folks. I supported it, which was, um, and if, I hope to describe it right, but it would have been repealing the decision uh, in state law of the Palmer decision to allow cities like Los Angeles to put inclusionary zoning in their specific plans if they do so wish. Um, that was not supported by some of my other colleagues who I would characterize as more moderate. But I think that we're going to see a slew of bills again. Um, some will be authored by Santa Monica and San Francisco. I also expect also to uh, do more housing bills because the challenge is real. We see it every day. But I also, for myself, um, want to take a step back because when you're looking at being a homeowner or, aff or affording rent, whether you're in Pacoima or in Venice, and you're not generating an income to support that rent or that mortgage, there's something wrong. And uh, what I believe is that too often we don't do enough in state government talking about the middle class. And uh, that'll be my focus. I've been talking about that in some op-eds that the Democrats have to do a better job of taking back that narrative. We are supporters and champions and uh, um, advocates for, for the poor. I think that we've done that with the state version of the EITC program and another measure, but I think there's more that we need to do to talk about that middle part of our economy that are just being frozen out because of income, because of restrictions and the like. So I, I think that hopefully this time next year we'll have more of, a, more of an update as to what we've done and uh, look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. Okay, well let's open it up to questions. And, uh, I, and I remind our panelists, if you, if you, you know, just jump in and if you want to um, uh, discuss amongst yourselves in front of all of us, uh, <laughs> feel free. That would be great. Okay, a hand is up in the back.
Nick, do you want to start on that one? <laughs> Not really. Uh, <laughs> so I don't. Uh, it's. I'm, I'm not in the in the prediction game, um, and I, I also am not uh, in the. So interest rates are problematic from from a land use regulatory perspective for two reasons. Um, one is to the extent that anyone has control over it, it's the Fed, um, and it's not a matter of state or local policy. And those are my two areas of focus. Uh, the second is that access to capital doesn't really seem to be the primary constraint on the provision of new housing in California, or at least in coastal California. And so I am not sure how sensitive to interest rates development is going to be. Uh, I think it will be, you know, it'll be as an academic, it'll be an interesting empirical question, um, but I think for the longer term for California, and not just thinking about the next couple of years, uh, thinking about the regulatory environment is wh where I think I would focus my attention. And on the empty units, um, so there's, I think, two things going on. One is the especially high-rise units uh, don't really match well with the incomes of the available buyers or renters. Uh, and that's a policy choice that we've made to build those kind of units. Um, uh, and it's a policy choice that the banks have been hesitant about. For example, in Oakland, there were 17,000 permitted unbuilt housing units. Um, a good number of those were high-rise towers that had been permitted for some number of years but to find enough people who can afford thirty-five to four thousand dollar a month rents, which is a fifty thousand dollar a year rent hit, or a hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year household, who want to live in eight hundred square feet in a former parking lot for Bart, was a challenge. <laughs> and those that are going up are going up based on the portfolio values of the developers, not based on the land value of the project. So we have a mismatch. The other thing that's going on is going on globally, much as we didn't, and actually former President Bill Clinton made a pretty potent speech about this last August on Phil Angelides' lawn in Sacramento. Neither party really got globalization and what, what it would do to the American worker. Housing is now globalized. We have a number of housing units that are owned by foreign families um, as either asset banks or escape valves or just, you know, fun houses that are sitting vacant. More, than, more of those are in high-rise multifamily units with doormen than single-family homes, but we have both, as you know. And that's taken a certain number of housing units off the market, which isn't being very well counted by anybody, including McKenzie, which I think did the best story of uh, uh, California's million-plus housing shortage for today's households, not for growth in the future. Um, so I think we're undercounting how much housing we need, and we're certainly not building a kind of housing that's affordable to actual California workers. Thank you. Uh, next question. Well, I'll chime in real quick. I know that one of the candidates, Mr. Chung, has opened up a ballot measure committee, and he's been talking about housing. And as the uh, the treasurer, is he the treasurer? I always forget. Um, he he's part of the TCAC, uh, uh, the, the tax credit program for affordable housing. For the few people who've asked me for my thoughts, uh, who are running for that office, I ask them, what are you going to do for the middle class? It's always nice to talking generalities and changing the world that California has to lead and you know resisting and persisting to what's in DC but I challenge them that whoever I'm gonna support and stump outside of my role of uh, the assembly member uh, for the Northeast San Fernando Valley is what are you gonna do for the middle class and when the uh, 
average house at Pacoima, and that's where I live, that's the base of my district, or the heart of my district, excuse me, you know, where there's a home there that's going for, you know, $450,000 built not that long after World War II, it's, it's amazing. And I think uh, there was an article by Steve Lopez about families in Silver Lake from other states now moving into Pacoima because Pacoima is more affordable now than those other places like at Water Village and so forth. So there is, and the folks who are gonna get squeezed out are the working class and the middle class. So, um, and you know, part and parcel of what are you gonna do for the middle class is housing, not just affordable family rental housing, which I support. When we were at the city in a very short time, the councilman who I worked for, we entitled and supported uh, and worked with good folks to get 400 units in less than four years done. But in terms of workforce housing or home ownership housing, which traditionally has been the path to the middle class, how do you do that? And I don't have the answers. And, and um, some, of the, some of the candidates who have called me, um, they've responded well. Some talk in generalities, but I want to see some details. Anyone else want to tackle that? Should go for the next question then. Well, if, if I oh, could just put please. in a plug. Um, so the, um, the civil rights group that I uh, mentioned is called the 200. Cruz Reynoso, uh, former justice of the California Supreme Court, also board member of NRDC for many years. John Gamboa, co-founder of Greenlining, which fights redlining. Again, 30-year veteran. Uh, Herman Gallegos, co-founder of La Raza nationally. Again, a major advocate. They put together a governor's forum uh, and I've forgotten the date, but it's in Los Angeles. I was trying to find the date, but I'm lame. Um, it's in Los Angeles in January. Its exclusive focus is housing, and it's housing for California workers. Nobody wants the projects. Nobody wants a handout. Just a fair shake for people who are actually working would be a nice change in terms of policy direction. I, I, and, and a nice addition in terms of policy direction. We have to do all of this, but that's a nice addition. I just want to inject one additional issue that it would be nice to see addressed in the governor's race, which is uh, when we talk about the middle class, the current housing crisis distinctly benefits some people who are members of the middle class, right? If, you, uh, if your home has appreciated, if you own your home and it's appreciated 200%, uh, that is a pretty significant uh, asset for you. Um, and I think that the discussion has to be oriented in a way that gives some confidence to homeowners that any changes are not going to result in declining home values. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think people are necessarily expecting another 200% increase, but I think there is a way to talk about multifamily development uh, that that isn't uh, a threat to existing single family home values and, and I, th I think that would be helpful for to bring into the governor's race for sure to put it on the on the agenda okay in the corner in the back I'll start it off and I'm sure Jennifer can take it from there. I agree with you. I think SB 35 is a compromise and I think the political will won't be there until we see the effects and who takes advantage of SB 35. For significant sequel reform, whether it's for infill or what have you, I think you're not going to find that anytime soon inside the state capitol. So the highest priority CEQA bill this year by the environmental community and labor was AB 890, which would have precluded citizen votes to upzone, whether for stadiums or for shopping centers or anything else, but would have precluded citizen votes to upzone property um, uh, and bypass CEQA. And bypassing CEQA is code for bypassing a leverage lawsuit. Um, I don't think anyone really 
is all that focused anymore on CEQA protecting public health or, or the natural environment. This is just a leverage lawsuit play. The governor vetoed that bill. The, governor veto, the governor's veto message said that he's not interested in doing piecemeal reform of CEQA or changes to CEQA, I think was the term he used. He wants a more comprehensive um, reform effort, which he wants to focus on this next year. Um, I want to say two things more uh, with the governor's current governor's win behind our backs, hopefully. Um, one is this very cynical use by certain lawyers representing certain trades, not all trades, uh, of CEQA lawsuits uh, is informed and funded by a campaign strategy of finding assembly and senate districts with lower levels of inherent income and targeting those races for substantial regular contributions. That has earned a degree of loyalty which we really haven't seen on a sequel issue in the legislature since the prison guards controlled Sacramento and ended up with sequel exemptions for prisons. I'm really out front about this. The governor's out front about it. It's just time to call it for what it is. The second thing I want to say, and it's related, Ana Caballero, who's a uh, I think a very pragmatic, long-term uh, 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 member of, uh, of uh, the political machine, if you will, uh, and an assemblywoman from Salinas, had this very simple bill that said we have a retail revolution on our hands. We have how many underutilized strip malls in how many places that are already fully served by roads and infrastructure and everything else. How about if we just touch those? How about no exemptions from CEQA, but the remedy in a CEQA lawsuit is to fix whatever the study is and do more traffic, whatever, but not stop the project. We know these are sites that are not gonna harm the environment. We know there's not too many of them in the greater scheme of things. And we know they're all over the place and they would create instant work for construction workers, and instant housing for people who desperately need those housing, uh, those housing units. Christina Garcia is the chair of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee and declined a plea to keep that bill alive and demanded and got a party line vote killing it in its first policy committee. I'm sorry, I know Christina, I like Christina. That did a disservice to California workers, and it did a particular disservice to this community. Strip malls have inherent value. Let's un unleash their real value and turn them into some decent multifamily housing without destroying home values in the residents that live behind them. I mean, it's a simple, common sense solution that has been 100% frustrated by bad, bad lawyer gimmickry. Let's call it. So call your own legislator and let's see about giving the governor a little support this time in the legislature. Okay. Um, right here, Ranjit. So I, I would say, I don't think we know yet um, about a lot of this, but I uh, appreciate and understand your uh, hesitancy. I think, um, you know, the, the accessory dwelling unit piece of legislation I talked about was a bit of a surprise for me, um, that it sort of flew under the radar and then it was there. But in the year since it's passed, we get probably 
15 to 30 calls every day from individual people using that piece of legislation to add a second unit to their backyard. That by removing barriers, by just saying that uh, the approval process can only be so cumbersome, the fees can only be so bad, like it has opened up a new venue. And I've always been somebody who was a little bit hesitant to say that second units were gonna be part of the solution. They're, of course, they can't solve the whole thing. They're only going to add a certain amount of stock. But I think it was a picture to me of what um, good technical assistance and tools could provide. So I think you're right. There, there are a lot of nuances to this package. But I think if we can make clear to developers what is there at their disposal to help streamline projects, um, and we can provide as much um, information up front as possible about how these things can work for development. We can do something about that. Um, but I, you know, a lot of policy is done by trying something and seeing the gaps. I'm also optimistic that if we do see that we will see what works and what is spurring more development, what is removing substantial barriers, and what isn't um, making a big enough difference. And you know, I don't think the legislature is done thinking about housing. So some of this we have to see um, what can upfront planning, ministerial approval in certain cases, making it a lot harder for cities to deny projects um, does. And, and where are projects still facing big timelines in terms of approval? Um, what types of projects are they? Um, I think the fee piece, encouraging density, uh, but, or I guess lessening the discouraging of density through fees is gonna be probably something big that comes out of sort of the next iteration of these things, but more to come. Uh, because I've served in local government for 16 years, I share your pessimism. Um, you pretty much articulated my uh, inside voice. <laughs> hey, look, most of the developments that are happening now that are home ownership or family rental or what have you, um, they were projects that were entitled or began entitlement when Mark Deerking and I served for that same city council member over a decade ago, maybe even mo a lot more than that. So. Um, a recent project got a lot of pushback from activists, and it was the RD3 product and the RD1.5 product. They don't want to see that. They want to see the, the RD1 product <clears throat> because of MTA's potential investment on the uh, transitway on Van Nuys Boulevard. We've got people who are activated now saying, well, we need to start planning for what's going to happen there. Um, you and I have talked about that because they don't want to see the kind of residential displacement that other parts of the county have. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, avoiding site plan review on units that are, you know, under 50 units now under SB 35, hopefully that will provide some cover. But, you know, knowing how local officials react and how they always want some kind of cover, um, I'm hoping that a couple of good projects that are in the pipeline now by good d developers get that opportunity because they're now at the... Uh, well, they're over, 50, they're over 50 units, and under the, uh, you know, the current conditions, they'd have to go to site plan review, and the council members would hear from the neighborhood council members, and they'd hear from people in the area. My hope is that a couple of good projects, and there won't be a lot. I'd be surprised if they're up to 200 units taking advantage of SB 35, maybe even a lot less, can get by in that uh, in entitlement process with some political support. I'll just add one more thing to that, because you were talking about what you can do, and I think the thing that I forgot to mention is community opposition continues to be a big piece of this. And I mean, some of the reason we get CEQA lawsuits was what Jennifer was talking about in terms of people trying to extract things, but some of it is also uh, the desire for neighborhoods not to change, and all of that still exists, and all of that still drives the delay and the barriers um, that go up. And so I think that's a role that neither the state or the legislature can really play, but at the local level, having conversations like this where people want to see more housing supply 
uh, it needs to happen in order to sort of shift the waters of at the project by project level what what people are willing to to do to move things forward. I, I would just add that I think as a matter of politics, maybe the state uh, legislature can't do anything about this kind of local opposition, but as a matter of law, mm -hmm. it certainly could, right? I mean, yeah. the state delegates the power to zone to local governments. It's an incident of the police power, and the purpose is to protect general welfare. So if the state thought that limiting that uh, discretion would promote the general welfare, it would certainly be well within its rights to impose limits. And one way to do that would be to say, look, the state needs more low and moderate income housing, uh, more middle income housing, right, 120% of area median income. We know that local governments are best positioned to figure out how to accommodate this, so please go ahead and do it. And then, if you can't figure out how to do it, if at least 10% of your housing stock isn't low and moderate income, or if at least 15% isn't at 120% of AMI, then your uh, ability to deny projects, regardless of the underlying zoning, is somewhat impaired, right? I mean, that's an alternative solution that seems to not have a ton of uh, political traction in the legislature, but it has worked reasonably well in other states mm -hmm. that have tried it. And, and I do think that with um, bills like AB 72, it's obviously not an appeals board concept, but it does open up, I think, a little bit more clarity that the state can step in and say, you aren't uh, adhering to the spirit of what you wrote in your housing plan. Yeah. You aren't meeting your housing goals. Uh, you aren't doing the things you promised to do, and we're going to pull your compliance. So I, I have a today, much, you know, very pragmatic approach for dealing with approvals today, which I haven't talked about at all. Um, one is never do another EIR for an infill project. Just don't do it. EIRs are statistically the most likely to be sued. Every part of this region is covered by multiple EIRs that are already in the can. EIRs have no expiration dates unless they're called master EIRs, in which case they expire after five years. You should be doing EIR addenda. EIR, big, big letters on the cover page, addenda, little letters. And it should be about a 50 to 60 page document instead of a full blown EIR that goes straight to the uh, approval process as opposed to going through the three year EIR torture fest. Um, now you still have to do technical reports on traffic and make sure each of the city departments is okay and all the rest of it. You do all the normal stuff, but an EIR addenda unlike a negative declaration, is as protective in the judicial sense as a full-blown EIR. It's not, a, it's not fair argument standard, it's substantial evidence. So that is the most pragmatic thing, as well as make liberal use of the categorical exemption for infill projects that's widely available uh, in LA. Much more difficult and institutionally, intentionally difficult were streamlining tools created by the legislature including SB 35, uh, although Scott did a great job, Senator Weiner did a great job um, shepherding that through with the help of the Housing Committee. It was a tortured political adventure, as have all uh, housing streamlining uh, CEQA um, statutes. So ignore them, stay with an EIR addenda or a um, infill exemption. The other two things is use the phone, call Abundant Housing LA and get 20 or 50 millennials to send emails to the council people or the commission people and have 10 of them show up to counteract the six old people who show up and say no. Okay. Call the Hispanic National Realtors Association, call organizations, call churches, organize a little bit. There's no question, and we've done this over and over again, that we can have more people in the room supportive of the project. Everybody is touched by the housing crisis. If we went around this room and I asked, do you know anybody who's touched by the housing crisis? You talk about your kids, your cousins, your mom, the, real, the, the, the preschool teacher, the nurse. Everybody is touched. So use that political reality and turn people out. Mm -hmm. NIR addendum will shave two years off your project process and uh, the outreach effort will um, counteract 
the old people, people are a little tired of baby boomers, I think. I am, and I'm one of them. Um, uh, so, so that's today's pragmatic approach. It's not leadership from the state. Dodger. <laughs> No, not even close. You know what, we're, we're just about out of time. We only have a couple minutes left. So um, with, with that, just if everyone wants to, they can chime in uh, about a minute each, and I think uh, you will get the last question. You will get, yes. Um, so Keep Your Home California is still running, just for those who don't know, uh, to help people avoid foreclosure. Um, it's run by the California Housing Finance Agency at the state. Um, but I think on the other, the new opportunities you're talking about, um, those are explicitly spelled out as potential uses of SB2 funds. Um, so the majority of those, um, that's the California Homes and Jobs Act, which is the We've been referring to it a little bit as the trust fund, but the majority of those funds will go to local governments um, who can run um, support programs like that um, for up to 120% area median income households, um, and in certain cases up to 150% um, area median <coughs> income households. So you could absolutely run programs like that. Um, and then the state does still have down payment assistance um, for uh, those, those income groups as well. If I could just quickly chime in, and I don't want to sound like a downer, but I know a lot of millennials, very few of them make enough money to support a mortgage. So I kind of go back to what I was saying before. How do you, you know, help people in the middle class or whatever we call the middle class now to be able to afford to be a homeowner when the average in Pacoma is $450,000? Right, and, and um, when Los Angeles County is the capital of McJobs in the nation, 
we got low wage, low re and if we have any friends from McDonald's here, I'm not making fun. Hopefully my friend Wesley from McDonald's isn't here. Um, there, there's a problem. So I don't know what kind of home ownership program with that kind of deep affordability can help somebody, especially somebody younger, just starting out, become a homeowner. Well, obviously part of the solution needs to be to drive down the cost of building new units. Um, it's not sustainable now, hence the vacant units and the unbuilt permitted units. So that's a key part. We have to be realistic about what we can afford and that is gonna offend a lot of people who think they have a vision of what the future should be and that vision is not affordable for people. Um, the second thing is uh, the uh, uh, mortgage assistance programs available now are not uh, uh, really tailored to the home pricing uh, structures that happen in metro areas um, and so they're not unfortunately effective. Um, they can be used in the Central Valley Inland Empire sometimes when there's money uh, and there is some money. Um, I do uh, have the highest level of sympathy um, for millennials uh, and, uh, and it's time for you to vote uh, because if we continue with a piecemeal approach, for example, all government agencies across the state are sitting on some amount of surplus property, uh, even if it's you know the DMV with the huge parking lot and a one-story office. Think about putting that one-story office in you know the bottom floor of a housing unit, right? And now suddenly you've created a housing site uh, from government um, uh, offices. So, um, but what's happened in Sacramento? is only those interests that have a special and powerful backing are getting traction. So there was a reform, thanks um, uh, very much to the legislature, that allowed school districts to put their housing units out, or to, to build housing on surplus school pro district property and limit the um, occupancy, or at least preferentially choose occupants that were school district employees which is otherwise not legal, right? Is you, you can't build housing and then limit it to your employees. That's not really okay. Um, uh, we could touch that law again and create company towns. It feels a little icky to me. But the whole thing of, you know, only if you have the teachers union behind you is your profession possibly gonna, um, you know, make it into, into the middle class. And that's crazy. Uh, we shouldn't have to rely in a, Democrat two-thirds majority on special interest lobbying to help working families. And that's to date what we've had. So enough. You guys need to vote. I think that's, a, that's where we're gonna end it. So you get the final word. I, I, I wanna just uh, thank all of you. Sapphire Construction and Development was thrilled to sponsor this, uh, along with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Thank you guys. And we also want to thank the track sponsors, Metro and Parsons. And please, a big round of applause for this panel. Thank you all. I've got a few quick announcements. Please be sure to fill out the exit survey uh, and uh, turn it in to a uh, VICA staff or an intern or an ambassador or at the registration desk. Next panel begins at 11 a.m. In the meantime, Please visit the exhibitors, and if you do your bingo cards, uh, you can get uh, be eligible for prizes, including a round-trip flight on Southwest, a fan pack from the Rams that includes assigned football and game tickets, and tickets to Magic Mountain. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to give each panel member uh, two minutes. We're just going to go from the left to the right. So, Phil, why don't you start? Sure. Um, Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And let me thank uh, VICA, uh, first of all. Uh, we're proud to be a platinum sponsor uh, for this conference and uh, very proud to partner with VICA uh, frequently uh, on these conferences. Let me also thank uh, BYD as the sponsor of this panel, I believe. Uh, thank you all. I don't see Stella, though. Where's Stella? Stella. No, she's not here. All right. I, I, I like to scream her name, Stella, from the movie. Um, 
We're working with VICA on a number of San Fernando Valley transit projects through the planning process uh, into construction so we can deliver these projects that are Measure M. I think everyone in here knows that uh, we were successful uh, with Measure M. The voters passed Measure M last November. Hard to believe it's a year, uh, a year ago. Uh, 71 percent, over 71 percent of the vote. We are in full implementation mode right now. Um, and there are uh, a number of projects right here in San Fernando Valley, uh, the East San Fernando Valley Transit Corridor, uh, the Metro Orange Line improvements uh, that we're doing right now, the North San Fernando Valley BRT to connect communities uh, of the North Valley, uh, the uh, Sepulveda Transit Corridor that we just announced that we are moving forward with um, a project development agreement, uh, another sort of version of a public-private partnership. So we are in full implementation mode uh, here in the Valley uh, and also all over uh, LA County. Uh, we have numerous projects under construction. I won't go into all of them right now, uh, but suffice it to say that we are moving very, very aggressively uh, to implement these projects. And I think later on we'll get into a discussion of uh, acceleration and kind of specifics on what we're doing, but I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Phil. Alisa? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity for Metrolink to participate today. Um, Metrolink is uh, celebrating our 25th anniversary this year and a uh, long partnership with uh, many, many of you here and uh, in, the, in the Valley and, and uh, working on several projects as well. Uh, happy to be working with Metro on uh, Measure M projects and putting together a, a list of projects to uh, support implementation of, of that in important initiative and also uh, for the Olympics. Uh, working on that. Um, we uh, also are, are celebrating our, our, our anniversary here with the introduction into service of our new Tier 4 locomotives, uh, which are the uh, cleanest diesel engines um, in commuter service. Uh, so they, they, are, they are out on the lines now. Uh, if you, you see them out there, we'll be introducing them. So we're uh, very happy to get out our, um, our, our clean diesel uh, locomotives out there. And here uh, in the Valley, we are working on a new uh, train to plane um, connection at the Burbank Airport uh, on our Antelope Valley line uh, that is uh, scheduled to, to start construction very soon in the spring and uh, will be open uh, sometime in the summer. So looking forward to continuing to work with all of you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, and I wanted to say thank you to Vika for having us here today. Um, I wanted to use this chance to introduce BOID. I think some of you who may have heard of BOID um, know that we, we produce electric buses, and in fact, we are the world's largest electric bus manufacturer. So we have 27,000 buses on the road globally. Um, we're extremely gratified to be expanding our footprint here in the U.S. with partnerships with Metro um, to help them electrify the Silver Line as part of their pathway recently announced to zero emissions. Um, and we really do see that the future is electric and we're excited to be part of it. Um, we're excited to be part of Los Angeles. Uh, we came to LA in 2011 and we set up our North American headquarters in downtown LA and manufacturing up in North County in Lancaster. Uh, we have 800 employees regionally. We just expanded our manufacturing facility. We tripled the space. We're going to be able to produce 1,500 electric buses there and trucks shortly. Uh, we have the ability to hire up to 1,200 people at full production. Um, but we're also much more than a bus manufacturer, and that's part of what I wanted to talk about today. Our place on this panel, we have a full transportation solution, um, electrified transportation solution. We also do electric trucks. That's medium and heavy duty. We have over 1,000 electric trucks on the road worldwide. We have over 140 orders here in the U.S., with 70 being delivered by the end of the year. That's UPS trucks, that's box trucks, that's port trucks, that's port equipment. Um, we're really talking, well, that's refuse trucks, some with the city of L.A., some with other municipalities. What we're talking about is really taking the entire transportation system and electrifying it. Um, 
we're also talking about making sure that that can be renewable. So it's, you know, making sure that you have zero emissions in the communities that are impacted, silent operations in the communities as well. But we produce solar panels and renewable energy storage, so battery storage. And we've been doing integrated microgrids at the Port of LA um, with some innovative P3 partnerships um, we've been developing with other transit agencies as well. We'd like to see that really roll out to support this transition to an electric future. And the last thing that we've really done, we know that that addresses end user emissions uh, in those roads, but to really transform the thing, the transportation system, we also obviously in LA need to look at congestion. And our last approach to that right now is SkyRail, which is our new light rail alternative. And we've invested $5 billion, about 10% of our 220,000 uh, work, worker workforce is focused on R&D, and we've been rolling this product out. It's an advanced monorail system, much better than The Simpsons, I promise. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it's a fully electric system, autonomous. It is more flexible, more, uh, much cheaper than pretty much anything except at grade light rail where you already own the right of way. Um, you can roll it out in two to three years from start to finish. There's a lot of prefab product. And we're looking at this as a really transformative solution for urban systems where you don't really have that land access and where you're able to build an elevated, flexible, um, an, an entirely new approach to transit that can integrate with existing light rail lines or subway lines. So we're looking at this, it's rolling out. We have 40 miles that'll be on the road by the end of the year worldwide, another 170 under development. We see an immense interest in the developing world and we think that we're pretty excited about it, what it could look like here in LA and globally. Thank you, those are exciting advancements. Uh, George. Thank you. Uh, George Minter with Southern California Gas Company. We're not a transportation agency or a transportation uh, company. Uh, we're an energy utility regulated uh, by the Public Utilities Commission, which represents the interests of the public. Uh, but for the last 25 years, uh, we've been working with a lot of public sector agencies and a lot of transit agencies uh, to move clean fuels into the transportation sector to displace dirtier fuels. And, particularly with MTA, which became the first 100% uh, uh, diesel-free fleet uh, that went entirely to CNG, compressed natural gas. You compress natural gas, <clears throat> put it on canisters on the roof, and that becomes uh, uh, the clean fuel that powers uh, uh, buses. And this uh, really actually contributed significantly to the uh, progress in clean air throughout uh, the Los Angeles basin. Um, we're in the heavy-duty sector in a lot of public fleets, trash haulers, street sweepers, transit buses. Uh, but for the last decade, uh, the Air District has uh, come to us and asked us to work with them and the Energy Commission to develop an e even cleaner combustion engine using natural gas that would be virtually zero in emissions or near zero. Uh, and we developed this uh, low NOx engine that's 90% cleaner than today's a certified engine, which means we can reduce uh, transportation emissions by 90%. Uh, MTA is actually buying those buses, as is Big Blue and Orange County and all of the large transit agencies. Uh, we're now developing uh, with the, the agencies a heavy-duty truck engine, which actually right now is going through certification at ARB, and it will also be at this 0.02 grams of NOx per brake horsepower hour, which is a threshold, a target, to be, quote, near zero or zero equivalent. It's roughly equivalent to emissions associated with generating the electricity to power an electric bus or an electric engine, uh, given the average California grid mix of renewable and non-renewable resources. Um, our focus, you know, is not really on selling gas or being in the transportation business. Um, we actually don't make money buying and selling gas. We're not allowed to make money. We're a utility company. Our business is pipes. We deliver energy. Uh, we earn a return on our investment in delivering energy, but the cost of uh, natural gas is a path through, uh, is a pass through. But we're in this business because we can reduce emissions. And when you look at uh, air emissions in LA, 90% of the polluting emissions comes from the transportation sector, and heavy duty transportation is the biggest problem. And that's why we've been working in this space 
uh, for the last uh, 25 years uh, with public agencies to reduce those emissions. Um, we're seeing deployment now of this near zero engine. We'll see it in the trucking sector. Um, and now we're seeing something very new in the gas business, and that is that all that fossil gas in the transportation sector is being eliminated, and instead we're using renewable gas. I think MTA is at about 60% renewable gas, and I think by year end they plan to be 90%. So renewable electricity is only required to be 33% renewable by 2020 under AB 32, and the, the new goal in 2030 is 50% renewable, but uh, we're already at 90% renewable. Um, what's renewable gas? Well, it turns out that our waste stream produces methane, and that's what natural gas is, and when you replace our waste stream methane after you capture it, uh, from the gas that's in the pipeline, you get a renewable gas, uh, one that's non-depletable and one that is a net zero carbon cycle. So that's where we're going, um, and we see this as a, a very important contribution to clean air, uh, to clean energy. You know, uh, all of us talk a lot about clean energy and 100% renewable, 100% clean energy, and mostly we're talking about electricity or electrification, uh, but there's a lot of uses of energy that's not electricity. So we've got to look at renewable fuels as well. and We've got to uh, look at renewable gas supply and other renewable fuels. And so that's what we're focused on. We're pleased to be here. Thank you, Vika. All right, let's get into some questions. What I'd like to do is I've got a few questions directly for the panel. I'm going to start there. I'd like everyone around this table to participate as well. Uh, once we get going, I ask that you raise your hand and hopefully we'll call on the first person as we go. Uh, I would say that since last year's conference, there has been tremendous progress in the region on transportation. Measure M, SB1, the momentum now building because of the Olympics, the advances in what we heard through uh, more uh, energy efficient fuels and also the advances in vehicle technology are all pretty significant. So what I'd like to do is start off with a question to Phil. Measure M is an ab ambitious 40 year plan to transform public transit in Los Angeles. What opportunities in Metro is Metro leveraging to accelerate delivery of these projects, and how much can we accomplish in time for the 2028 Olympics? Well, thank you for the question. Let me first say that I was actually hoping we got the 2024 Olympics so I could keep the pressure on. <laughs> um, but we are, and even before the announcement for the 2028 Olympics, we were looking to accelerate projects uh, as best we could. We created um, our Office of Extraordinary Innovation, Joshua Shank, uh, who is the chief of that office, is here. Uh, and our thinking all along was, how can we move projects forward? Uh, how can we uh, accelerate uh, things like the CEQA process? And I just talked to Jennifer, our friend, uh, on how we can do these things. How can we move forward uh, with these processes that are out there, the environmental processes and all of these different studies to accelerate projects. Uh, let me say that for the Olympics, uh, in the bid package, uh, we contend and we told the Olympic Committee that we really did not need additional infrastructure to host the Olympics right now. That was part of our bid and that was part of our discussion with the, with the committee. Um, but by 2028, um, this region is going to look a lot different than it does right now. Um, the projects from Measure R that we are in full construction on, uh, the Crenshaw line is 75 percent complete. We will open that, that line up in less than 24 months. The regional connector, which is going to be a huge game changer uh, for the whole county, uh, is about 40% complete. It's the downtown project that we're doing that will facilitate a one-seat ride all the way from Azusa all the way down to Long Beach. Huge game changer. Um, the purple line, we're moving forward out west. We're moving these projects forward right now. Uh, we created an unsolicited proposal policy that many of you know about that allows the private sector to come in to us unsolicited and not have to wait for an RFP, but come to us with their ideas and we can push projects along. So we are being very, very aggressive, not just with transit projects, but on the highway side as well. Our highway chief is here, uh, Abdullah Ansari uh, is here as well. So 
we, while we're being aggressive, there's other things that we need to do, though. Uh, the permitting process in the various cities needs to be expedited. Uh, yes, we're doing street closures and things like that in cities, and we know we inconvenience uh, a lot of cities. Uh, but at the end of the day, these transportation investments will be a huge benefit uh, for the cities and the communities uh, that we are building these projects in. And, you know, we should actually be celebrated when we come into town uh, instead of hit with lawsuits. Um, I mean, we should be celebrated like uh, the U.S. troops uh, are, were celebrated when, when uh, Germany was liberated and all those kinds of things. I'm, maybe I'm wishing for too much. But we have to find a way, I think, and, and this falls into the area of acceleration of projects. We have to find a way, not just here in LA County, but nationally with these infrastructure projects to speed them up. They take too long. They really do uh, with the environmental piece, with permitting, all of those things, uh, they take too long. So that's probably too much of an answer for you. Um, but um, we are looking to accelerate as best we can. Uh, the bread and butter of project management, though, uh, has to be key. We have to be better on our side of the table as project managers. Uh, and the private sector, the general contractors, uh, have to do better as well uh, and we have to work together to speed these projects along. Alyssa, you had also mentioned the Olympics and the acceleration of, of projects as they tie into your program. How is Metrolink partnering with uh, Metro and also local transportation providers? One of the, the most important things that we can do is uh, try to increase the frequency and reliability of our service to get more passengers on the train, more riders on the train, and reliably get them to their destinations. Uh, so we are uh, working on a package um, to work with Metro and, and, and other local partners of uh, how we can look at some investments, some infrastructure, some system investments that we can make to prepare ourselves uh, for this increased service. Uh, the other, we're, we're deploying uh, the we're using technology and deploying new technology to try to enhance the customer service um, and the customer experience that we have. For example, we have a mobile app. I mean, one of the things, especially when, when people or new people are coming to town, they're coming to visit, um, they want to know easily, how do I get to my destination? Uh, and using a mobile app in order to purchase your ticket, show your ticket, also for wayfinding and scheduling, um, we've introduced a new Where's My Train uh, app um, and feature as well uh, to try to provide information to provide we want our riders and our, our, our uh, passengers to have choices um, and working with uh, our partners so that they have choices most of our riders don't just take a train they're taking a train a long distance but they probably had to somehow get to the train station and they probably have to get from the train station somewhere so working with our local uh, transportation partners is critical um, in a commuter rail system. We have um, over 15 free transfers to our local um, transportation agencies, uh, Metro being uh, obviously a major one. Over half of our customers transfer at Union Station to either Metro Rail or to the bus. Um, and we're in the process um, of implementing the, the newest technology for our mobile app uh, to get through the metro gates, the metro rail gates, if there are lock gates throughout the system as well. So it's just use your phone, no paper, and uh, it's a seamless uh, transfer. So those partnerships and coordination are, are key to uh, increasing ridership and then increasing the reliability and the frequency of the service we can provide. So I guess I have a following question to that because technology seems to be rising quick and really changing the way transportation is, is moving forward. And you talked about almost like a one-stop system with your app. Are you working then with Metro on other uses? Is there a way to have it so that thinking of bike share and all these other modes that we use in the system, is there coordination going on so that we just have one-stop technology? 
definitely looking in, into those options. So once we uh, have that shared technology that we're using um, and coordinating with our various vendors in order to implement that and have those systems be able to talk to one another, that is really important. Um, being able to, uh, whether it be a ride share or um, a bike share or whatever it might be, just from your phone, you figure out, I know I do this, where I go and I look to see what is the quickest way to get to my destination. It might be to take commuter rail, it might be to take metro rail, it might be to go grab a bike <laughs> on a bad day. And that's what we want to be able to provide from your smartphone, that's the way people are, you know, doing. We want to be able to provide other more traditional, you know, sources as well, but going forward, the technology is going to be key. We had a very successful co-partnering uh, co um, agreement with Lyft, um, where we offered uh, two free tickets um, to Lyft riders, and Lyft riders um, got a discount um, by using our, our service, so I think that integration um, all from the convenience of your phone and one click uh, is, is the direction of the future for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and thinking more broadly about the work happening at LAX with the People Mover, when you arrive in LA, how are you going to get to Union Station? You want to make that easy for people visiting, people who live here. So in the theme of transport, uh, sorry, in, th in the theme of technology, uh, Rebecca, with your advancements and the things that you've been studying, both in, in bus and also you mentioned new light rail technology. How will your electric vehicles bring greater efficiencies to our transportation system? I, I think efficiency is, is, there's two aspects to think about. One is the, the energy efficiency and what it can do for energy efficiency and, and inherently buses are, electric buses are more energy efficient. Um, kind of there's benefits for the end users as well with emissions certainly. Um, but in terms of congestion mitigation, what we're looking at is much more of our SkyRail and that provides more efficiency for end users. So how do you integrate it? Um, if you're talking about kind of two to three years for construction timelines associated with full system implementation for the light rail alternative, it's elevated, you're not going to have the land acquisition. I mean, that, that's construction. We're not talking about the permitting and the environmental side, which we agree really does need to be sped up. Um, but I think that we see this as part of the solution um, for the 2028 Olympics, for what Los Angeles is going to look, look like. It can connect to existing systems. Um, we're talking with some universities about utilizing it to connect to their, the closest light rail stop. So I think that there are ways to have a multimodal system and then you integrate with rideshare, you integrate with bus system, you you look at some of the new micropilot questions that are coming out of yeah, certainly Metro, and we know that LADOT is looking at that. So there's so much innovation happening in this space. Um, you have the base technology, which we believe should be electric, but then you talk about autonomous, you talk about um, what's happening in the private sector as well. And, and I think that it becomes a really exciting, dynamic set of opportunities, some of what Alyssa mentioned as well. All right, you mentioned micropilot, which I think is the micro tra micro pilot transit project. So thinking of Phil's innovation yeah. office mm -hmm. and what you mentioned in your technology, Phil, can you speak to what Metro's looking at there? Yes, we are looking at uh, what we're calling micro transit. <laughs> Uh, and this is curb-to-curb -curb service that we're looking at uh, providing uh, at Metro, smaller vehicles providing curb-to-curb -curb service. I describe it um, as Uber, Lyft-like service uh, that we are looking to provide. We are uh, going to be very, very aggressive and have been very, very aggressive uh, in putting this out. I believe that we're working on an RFP right now. Uh, for providers of this type service to come to us uh, with ideas on how they can provide this service. The idea here uh, for us, not just with microtransit, but is to provide a and create a balanced transportation system where even the automobile is not the enemy. Um, and this microtransit uh, we see as a viable first last mile solution 
um, uh, to really partner with our system to provide transportation all over the county. So this is something we're being very, very aggressive with, this microtransit. Um, and that goes along with our bike share program that we're launching all over the county. Um, the, uh, the autonomous vehicle, uh, Metro Link and electric buses, all of this in my mind is the creation of a balanced transportation system that should be seamless, should be seamless. And as a matter of fact, we all should have the, the same fare media, if you ask me. Um, we all should have the same fare media, or whether that's a tap card or whatever, uh, that we can get on Metrolink, we can use, uh, use it to tap on the Metro system, we can use it for bike share, we can use it for micro transit as well. And so that is the path we're going down to create a seamless system that includes that curb to curb micro transit technology. George, you mentioned you're not a transportation provider, but energy has been obviously a key element of everything we've been talking about. And there's many initiatives and incentive programs on reduce, reducing emissions and improving air quality. Uh, how is SoCal Gas working with transportation agencies to reap those benefits, both financially and environmentally? Well, I think I covered a lot of that in my opening comments. Um, you know, we provide an energy resource, and where it makes sense to use it, uh, we'll, we'll use it. And about 25 years ago, the air districts came to us and said, look, we've really got to move uh, diesel out of transportation, particularly in public fleets where we can do refueling, and can you guys assist us? And that's how the gas company got involved in providing natural gas as a transportation fuel. Uh, we've led the industry, cities all over the nation have followed suit, transit agencies all over the nation have followed suit. MTA has been the national leader, actually is the worldwide leader, and today now with renewable gas, they are the worldwide leader in moving renewable gas uh, into transportation. Um, I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of modes of transportation, and we've really talked about transportation for folks. But there's also goods movement, um, and there's also long distance transportation. And what we're seeing now is a demand worldwide for natural gas to displace diesel in uh, the marine, uh, excuse me, bunker fuel in the marine sector, and also diesel in long distance rail, as well as long distance trucking. In Europe, a lot of the river trade is now natural gas instead of bunker fuel uh, for the ships. Um, a lot of the rail is moving to natural gas from diesel. Uh, and a lot of the trucking, long distance trucking, is going to natural gas. We're starting to see that happen here. Uh, we've been in discussions uh, with uh, all the rail companies nationwide to move natural gas. You would liquefy, it would be liquefied natural gas as on onboard fuel for long distance rail. Uh, we're talking to both ports as well as marine operators to provide LNG uh, as a marine fuel. Uh, today, um, the uh, Northwest. A trade is moving from bunker fuel to, to uh, natural gas. The Caribbean is now converting uh, to natural gas. Most of the Caribbean cruise liners are all natural gas fueled. Uh, most of the trade that will be coming out of the Europe in the next five years will all be natural gas fueled. So uh, these, by the way, these, are, these emissions are huge part of the problem. And when you move from bunker fuel, which is a very carbon-rich uh, fuel, to natural gas, uh, you get a very significant re uh, reduction in carbon. And the volume, because the volume of fuel is so great, it's a tremendous uh, climate change advantage. So we're now looking at, all right, how do we deploy natural gas, uh, not just in heavy-duty transportation like buses and trucks, but now rail and now marine, and then how do we develop renewable uh, gas so that instead of relying on fossil gas coming from, you know, fracking and, and other um, uh, practices that historically the industry, the production industry has been in, how do we move away from that and move towards renewable? Uh, we look at natural gas and gas energy just as we look at electricity. You know, for 30 years we focused on how do we make electric supply more renewable? We focused on solar and wind. And today we need to focus uh, on that same challenge with gas supply. How do we make it more renewable? Um, there is a program uh, that ARB uh, has adopted, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, and it's designed to drive down the carbon intensity of, of transportation fuel, uh, much like cap and trade, which 
probably all of you are familiar at least with that debate, the low carbon fuel standard is the same kind of a program but for transportation fuel providers. And it creates, uh, it provides a credit for lower and lower carbon intense fuel. And if you use that car lower carbon intensity fuel, or if you provide it, you receive the economic value of that credit. And that's what's driven the development of renewable gas. That's what's driven it into the transportation market. Uh, in 2013, um, and, and by the way, all of the transit agencies are, are uh, natural gas. No, none of them are diesel down in Southern California. Uh, yes, some of them are moving uh, uh, to, to electricity, but predominantly natural gas. Um, and all of them now are moving to renewable gas. In 2013, none of the natural gas uh, was renewable. In 2016, three years later, after the implementation of the low carbon fuel standard, 60% is now renewable. And by the end of uh, this year, under the program, 90% of the gas that's used in transportation will be renewable gas. George, you brought up uh, goods movement, and I want to stay on that just for a moment. Rebecca, you mentioned in your introduction that not only Skyway, which is about moving people, you also mentioned that you invest in electric trucks, develop products there. Can you talk a bit about the trends you're seeing both in goods movement as it relates to your transit and, and pedestrian movement investment? Certainly. I think that you know, goods movement is one of those things in Southern California that impacts all of us. It's We have the ports of LA and Long Beach are 40% move 40% of the nation's goods. Um, and that has tremendous economic benefits for the region, but it also has tremendous congestion issues and um, really worryingly huge emissions and public health mm -hmm. impacts um, and huge equity challenges because the, co the communities that are most impacted by the mm -hmm. trucks that operate and by the goods moving equipment um, tend to be the poorest and often communities of color. Um, and that, that goes for the ports themselves and then for the warehouses where these goods are offloaded and put back onto to rail or trucks and then go out from there. So this is an, a critical um, economic driver for the region and we really need to address what we're going to do with emissions. Um, so BYD has been developing uh, on-road truck products for many years and we've, we have five that are on the road now. Uh, we have in, in the ports of LA Long Beach, we have equipment, a lot of equipment. That's our fastest selling product. It can work 23 hours a day at electric and just one hour for charging. And we're seeing that that's being utilized in rail yards, that's being utilized in the ports. Uh, we're also working in partnership with the Port of LA to develop a top pick, one of those things that no one really knows about outside of the industry. But think of it as a giant crane that comes in, picks up your, your container and moves it over for where it needs to go. These are incredibly fuel intensive and emissions intensive. And so we're looking at ways to electrify that. These are all projects that are rolling out right now and they all absolutely need to be addressed to ensure that our communities can continue to function. And so on the goods movement side, we would love to see, I mean, there's to kind of build on the previous question, there's immense amounts of funding somewhat immense amounts of funding given the scope of the challenge right now coming out of ARB. We have voucher programs that have been targeted at on-road trucks. This year is the largest allocation to date. It's $180 million. Um, and that's going to cover 35 million goes directly to zero emission uh, transit. The remainder is going to go to all low emission technologies. That means low NOx uh, low NOx, natural gas, that means hybrid, that means zero emission electric, that means hydrogen. Uh, so that can really address a lot of what's happening with goods movement trucking around the ports and that tends to be the dirtiest, oldest pieces of equipment. Um, the poorest truckers, individual truckers go and buy the oldest trucks and use those. And the port is really looking at a transformative approach to move those trucks off the road, but they're trying to do it in a way that balances the environment and equity for those truck drivers who, who are the most marginalized in society already. So we need effective incentive programs for them. Then there's another $50 million program that is going to be off-road focused entirely, and that is the first time the state of California has done it. And these numbers sound big, but the scope of the problem is, is pretty huge. But we think that it's a down payment on making that happen. And I think that these incentives are really critical when we talk about commercializing this technology. Um, as a reference, BYD's buses used to be over a million dollars per bus, and that's certainly the number that some of you might have heard. 
but incentives have helped us really push this into the marketplace, commercialize, improve, get economies of scale, drive R&D into the battery, and really create energy density improvements year over year. And what we're seeing now is our buses are $750,000. That's a huge drop in six years. We're going to be able to achieve that with our trucks and our equipment as well as you put that investment in. And then those buses have huge operational cost savings. We're seeing you know, 20 cents per mile savings over diesel. You have huge maintenance savings, um, fuel cost savings. So these are the sorts of things that we need these investments to drive the market so you can commercialize it. Um, and we will see long-term benefits for the region. We're going to wait until those prices drop a little bit more. <laughs> Well, you are making a pretty big commitment to zero emissions as well, and I think that that sort of market signal is huge. You know, BYD is not the only player here. What you happened have... to the first buses that you got? The first buses were early. The MTA, those first buses, how are they doing? They are operating with no issue right now in Columbia, Missouri. So, you know, we were, we developed them. They were the first buses we brought here. I did that for Stuart. He walked in. He wanted some controversy. <laughs> Sorry. But it's true. These are the questions that people have about electric buses. It's new. Do they work? Well, you know, we, we admit that we had some challenges with how we rolled it out. We took the buses back in-house. We retooled them. We didn't change any of the equipment. We did change some of the software and diagnostics, put it out on the road again. Um, we're working with Metro, and with no issues to date, we're working with Metro on getting five new buses out for that. We're, and, you know, I don't think that Metro would have contracted with BYD to put 60 new 40-foot electric buses on the road if there were significant issues with operations. So I wanted to just jump in. Uh, you know, I said I'm not, we're not a transportation technology company. We're an energy company. But the truth is we're also an energy technology company, and we're developing a lot of uh, technologies for renewable energy development uh, that, are, that will be used in the transportation sector and are being used. Uh, a lot of people sort of uh, hear this argument that, you know, we're going to move towards renewable electricity, and then everything will be electrified, transportation, your home, just everything. But the reality is the energy world is very complex, and, and I'm not an ideologue. I don't believe in one total solution. I think there's lots of solutions. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox, and there are a lot of solutions that fit uh, different problems. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest, uh, particularly in, uh, in Asian nations, in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. You know, we've got Toyota, we've got uh, uh, Hyundai, we've got Honda all out now with fuel cell vehicles. There's a lot of interest, particularly in the light duty market, that, wow, these fuel cell vehicles, they're, they're going to really be great. And the idea is you don't need batteries, you have the electric motor and it's run by a fuel cell. Well, a fuel cell runs on hydrogen. Well, we're very interested in hydrogen. Where does hydrogen come from? Today, 99.9% .9 of all hydrogen comes from natural gas. All the hydrogen in Southern California comes out of our pipes and goes to Air Liquid or Prax Air or air products, and they do steam methane reformation, which basically means they take the C off of the methane and they turn it into CO2 and it goes into the air, and then they have hydrogen. So we think that that hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle is you know, clean because it doesn't have any CO2 emissions, but the CO2 is released over there at the factory to produce the hydrogen. So the challenge is how do we produce green hydrogen? How do we produce green energy? And we're working on a, a solution that's being deployed commercially in the EU nations, but we have yet in America to deploy this, and it's called electrolysis. They call it power to gas. And you basically, uh, it's been developed to store renewable energy, excess renewable energy. And in Germany, uh, 10, 15 years ago, they had a challenge with too much wind uh, in the North Sea area. And they were trying to get it off the grid because you can't put too much on the grid without it all coming, you know, you need a balanced supply and demand. Otherwise, the grid gets compromised, substations fry, and the grid doesn't work anymore. So you either shut down your resource or you get it off the grid. And we're looking at that same problem now in California. So the idea is you take that off the grid, you run it through water, through an electrolysis process, and that produces hydrogen and oxygen streams, and the hydrogen is your energy carrier. That's a green hydrogen pathway. We built the first uh, power to gas facility in America down at UC Irvine. Uh, we're running it uh, from there. They've got a lot of solar rooftop uh, on their parking lots, and midday there's way too much solar, uh, and so we're now producing renewable green hydrogen. And we're actually injecting it in the pipeline. 
Uh, and that's what's happening in Europe, is you produce the hydrogen, you eject it in the natural gas pipeline system, and it essentially, it's called hydrogen blending, and it reduces the carbon profile of uh, natural gas, makes it more renewable. Uh, some of the nations are looking at a 5% to a 10% threshold of renewable uh, uh, gas from hydrogen injection. And so we're looking at that same opportunity, and then that becomes a new fuel source for fuel cell technology. If, 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 if I could just, uh, you know, I, I think the key here is to allow for technology to continue to evolve and allow the private sector a path to introduce that evolving technology to us. And that is why it was very important for us to create an unsolicited proposal process. Uh, we want to be on the cutting edge, not the bleeding edge. Um, and so allowing the public entities to allow the private sector to a process to introduce ev ever evolving technology to us, I think is the key. Um, and so th that's kind of where we are within Metro. We want to hear those things. We want to hear uh, about these ideas, and we created a process where it can come to us. Let's open up uh, to questions here from the group. We covered a wide range of topics, so I'm sure there's many questions. Well, I'll start off. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Kobe. I think that uh, we have rules out there that no one knows why they w were created and nobody knows what they are. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it falls in that category of dumb rules uh, that uh, nobody knows where they came from. I think that uh, the idea first of a real unsolicited proposal policy helps uh, when we start talking about uh, technology, I think we have to allow for the private sector to introduce it. We have to be less prescriptive in our specifications. Uh, you know, this whole idea of the government saying you must have this widget and only this widget is ridiculous, uh, especially when it it uh, is married with the uh, public-private partnership or P3 delivery method. If I am telling the private sector, uh, especially if it's a full design, build, finance, operate, maintain, if I'm telling the private sector that they have to operate and maintain and I have the ability to penalize or incentivize based on performance metrics, uh, and they have an O&M contract, let's say over a 25 year period, and they want to use widget so-and-so, uh, and they think that that widget will allow them to, uh, in terms of life cycle, will allow them to better operate that facility, then why should I be prescriptive in telling them what widget I want them to use? You follow me? And, and then if I tell them that I want them to use that widget and then I penalize them if that widget goes down, what's up with that? So I think we should not, we cannot be as prescriptive as we have been uh, when we talk about um, you know, things that go out the door, RFPs that go out the door. We should allow for what's called alternative technical concepts um, where 
the private sector can come in and say, we have an approved equal or something like that that we can uh, use, uh, and that will uh, enhance the life cycle. So uh, every time I go to Washington, I get in trouble around this, right? And I don't care because uh, this prescriptive nature of our procurement documents uh, is, is, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It really is, and we're looking to change that at Metro. We have already started changing that uh, with, uh, with various uh, things that we're doing in procurement uh, and some cleanup of, of uh, just boilerplate language that uh, nobody knows where it came from. Here, here. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, I, you know, we've in the air quality arena and, uh, you know, every end use energy technology produces an outcome. Uh, and there's often been the effort, well, we want, want you to use just this. It's like, well, wait a minute, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And with air quality, it's emissions that produce ozone or uh, affect public health. It's usually particulate matter or NOx, which combines to form ozone. With climate change, it's GHGs. So at the end of the day, we ought to be saying, I want the technology that achieves this outcome, the lowest possible GHG emissions, the lowest possible air polluting emissions. Not this technology, not a fuel cell or an electric or a natural gas or a diesel, but what's the technology that delivers what my mission is, which in the case of transit would be ridership and distance and you know, maintenance costs, and then gets the best emissions, the lowest emissions profile for the problems we're trying to solve. And we deal with this, you know, for residential applications, business applications. You know, we're in a fight right now, you know, with, uh, with restaurant equipment. Um, how are we going to drive emissions down from fryers? Well, we developed a new technology that reduces emissions from food fryers. Um, you know, it's, it, it isn't just transportation. It's every arena where we use something that it has an outcome that has some impact that we're trying to avoid. Let's not mandate the technology. Let's not say what tool to use. Let's say, here's what we need the tool to do and which tool does it best. Performance based. Oh, okay. No, I was just going to address, I mean, obviously I concur <laughs> wholeheartedly with the panelists here um, and their comments and I, that's where we've had to become very creative um, in the way that we apply our procurement as well because by the time that we've procured something it is outdated for a, a technology and there are six new companies who are bang, you know, six new vendors banging down the door um, and so we've had to be become somewhat, ex, you know, we, we need to develop that expertise ourselves in how we are going about and procuring and what vehicles that we are using so that we are using the most, the, the most flexible and also the most interoperable. That is one of the things that I find in the procurement process. You, you, you get with one, one particular vendor and then that product won't speak to anyone else. And then you've got a very complex web that you're trying to piece together. Um, so the flexibility um, portions of, and aspects of procurement to be allowed to look at what is going to make your system work um, is, is really critical to finding that cutting edge technology. I'll give you another funny example of this. I mean, the city of Vancouver said, uh, passed a, uh, a motion that said uh, uh, no new um, uh, permitted facility, uh, no new construction or rehab uh, can uh, use natural gas anymore. And so it's, you know, okay. And the restaurant association and all the chefs flipped out because a bunch of them actually were rebuilding and installing new equipment. And they said, well, you, you have to use electric equipment. They're like, we're not using electric equipment. And there's this huge fight. And then there was this huge campaign where all the restaurant uh, folks and all of their patrons got together and went to the council and said, this is crazy. This is not what we want. And so the council deliberated and said, you know what? What we're trying to get to is renewable energy. So it's OK to use gas as long as it's at the same proportion renewable as electricity would be. So instead of mandating a technology again, they backed off and said, okay, what's the outcome we're trying to get at, which is more and more renewable energy. Show us how you can do that and then use the technology you choose. Customer choice comes into the equation as well. We have another question here.
Well, there's a lot of scoping meetings and feasibility studies and community meetings, uh, environmental, um, you know, um, uh, modifications and meetings. I mean, all of that, at the end of the road of all of that, uh, comes, uh, you know, some technologies is spit out. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we go with. And so this process, uh, quite honestly, that is why these projects take so long, though. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of uh, debating, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's kind of the way it should be because we don't want to sit, you know, in, in our building and just determine the technology uh, that will be on any one quarter. Uh, Sepulveda Transit Quarter is a great example. I mean, we have to go through a number of things. I mean, what uh, may be assumed uh, may not be the case after environmental is, is done and, you know, there may be environmental challenges with what we're thinking. And so it's that process. And uh, what we're talking about is trying to shorten the time frame for that process. But it's no shortcut there. I mean, um, you know, you know. Sometimes I wish we lived in a totalitarian society, um, where I could say, "Hey, listen, we're going to build that, and we don't care about what the community says. We're coming in, and the bulldozers will be here in two weeks." Uh, I.e., Robert Moses from New York City. Uh, but we can't do that. So this this is one of these things that it's a process. It really is. I don't know if that answers it, but. Another question? I've been talking too much. Well, I'll, I mean, I'll just comment generally. Uh, you know, I'm a lot more focused on the kinds of challenges that affect the environment that compromise public health or global health. And I've always seen VMT uh, really as a way of getting at reducing emissions uh, because you're reducing your mileage or you're expediting the flow of traffic. And either way, you reduce your emissions. Uh, I know everybody's now jumping on VMT as a congestion relief approach. Uh, and I would rather see VMT uh, uh, regulation be focused on emissions and not congestion relief. Uh, so for example, instead of looking at these kinds of uh, CEQA expansions, I would rather us uh, just start taxing people for their mileage. I'd rather see our car registrations based on the, uh, the, the mileage of, of, of the vehicle. Uh, and these kinds of things would cause people to drive less because it's an economic influence but they're geared towards reducing emissions. So, you know, congestion's a problem. Uh, maybe it's a health hazard if you're, you know, in an emergency, but it seems to me that VM VMT uh, measures should be focused on addressing more serious environmental concerns, and I'd rather see it addressed in that way. I think it's also just impossible to know what VMT is going to look like five, 10, years from now. I mean, we are going to have autonomous technologies that is going to change the entire traffic flow of our region. Um, and integrating it will be a challenge. This is not a technology challenge so much as it is really integrate, you know, if everything were autonomous, it would be really easy. But that's not, realistically, that's not what's going to happen. Autonomous vehicles are going to integrate with human vehicles and human dogs and human children and human people and we need have a lot of machine learning to do to optimize this but the ability to access autonomous vehicles will probably increase vmt um I, I think metro probably has the real data on this but my assumption is that there's been some increase in vmt with the 
use of Uber and Lyft. And if there are ways to better utilize it, to have micro transit, to have managed approaches, all of this, you can, you can get at the emissions side of it, but I think VMT is going to look so different 10 years from now that it's impossible. I, I, I mean, I don't think anybody wants CEQA to expand. <laughs> right. And yeah. so, I mean, and tying it to something that we have no ability to really project is, is a terrifying thought. And, and I'll just chime in. No, no uh, CEQA expansion. <laughs> um, I, you, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting what, you know, London has gone through and what New York is talking about. Uh, this, this, you know, vehicle miles travel and, you know, charging folks um, for travel uh, on city streets is very, very interesting. Um, some of you may be tracking that. Um, the governor, um, you know, is talking about uh, some sort of vehicle miles traveled in the downtown area in New York. And this is going to be really interesting. If you look at London, uh, and I believe they've already implemented some form of this in their downtown area. I mean, congestion is down 35, 40 percent. It's pretty incredible. And it's driving people to public transportation. And, uh, you know, this idea and, you know, this crystal ball effect, I mean, what will our industry look like in 20 years? I think there's going to be some form of VMT. I really do. Um, because, you know, it's not sustainable, whether it's uh, emissions, whether it's congestion. Uh, one of the things that we're doing at Metro now is working on our strategic plan, our strategic plan that will really guide the agency for the next, um, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. And we're studying this piece. We're studying this idea of uh, vehicle miles travel. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of ways that we are going to reduce congestion uh, here in L.A. County. It, it's just, you know, and, and unless gasoline goes back up to, you know, goes up to 150 miles a gallon or something, I, you know, I don't know. Um, what, well, that's a lot, though. A barrel, a barrel, not a gallon. Uh, so, so, you know, it's, uh, we, it, it's going to be interesting to see you know, what happens to this industry, what happens to congestion, what happens to transportation in the next 10, 20 years, it's gonna be interesting. You know, what's funny is in the 80s, uh, the Air District was looking at a plan that was gonna regulate VMT, and they were proposing odd even drive, driving days. Right. And everybody flipped out. And that was in the 80s, when VMT just wasn't the problem it is today, and congestion wasn't the problem it is today. But nobody's talking about that now. And I find that curious that nobody's talking about that, because that's an easier way to manage both congestion, VMT, than other ways of managing it. I'm sort of curious that no regulatory agency is addressing oh, that. They, they have, they've, they've looked at it, but there's, there's a pol real political challenge. You look at what's happening with SB1 right now, and SB1 is the giant um, trend you know, gas tax increase that is absolutely necessary for our transportation infrastructure improvements. And the moment that it was approved, now there's recall elections out there for certain politicians who voted for it. Um, there's a recall measure on the ballot to pull SB1 back. Um, this is vital for California's transportation needs and, and people, you know, you don't want a gas tax. Well, it's similar. I mean, VMT makes sense. As we're moving to electric vehicles, you know, I'm not we have to look at ways to appropriately tax the vehicles that are on the road. Everybody should be paying their appropriate share, and gasoline and diesel drivers should not be subsidizing roads for electric vehicle drivers. That's not what we want. We need some sort of a VMT, but it's a, a major political challenge. And I think that that's where the people in this room, where the advocacy of VICA, I mean, for business, we need effective roads. We need effective taxation. We don't want problematic taxation, but I think that things like this, most of us would agree, really help the state to move. And I think that these are real battles we're going to be seeing in the next few years. Another question?
Let me let me start with that because that's that's one of my that's one of my things. Um, we I believe if we don't address the workforce issue, uh, the qualified workforce issue, it is going to be a major challenge uh, for infrastructure projects, not just here but all over the country. A uh, huge challenge. We are we have been very very serious and deliberate about putting together a career pathway at Metro. Uh, this career pathway that now will start with a school, a transportation school. We are gonna start uh, a transportation school grade six to 12 uh, because that is, we need to reach young people early on uh, and begin to train young people on the hard to fill positions in the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure sector. And so this issue then of capacity, not just with contractors, because I'm concerned about that too, by the way, um, but a qualified workforce is, I believe, a national emergency. It's a national emergency. Uh, you know, we see the natural, the natural disasters that occurred in Houston and Puerto Rico and Miami. Well, those disasters are actually wiping out infrastructure. Uh, and we do not have the workforce all over the country uh, to address it. And so what we envision is LA County being the center of transportation infrastructure excellence. What we envision is if there is a natural disaster and infrastructure is wiped out uh, 10, 15 years from now, people say we need folks from LA County, just like a brigade of firefighters coming in to help fight a fire to help build and rebuild infrastructure in this country. And that is what the vision is in terms of workforce. We've got to start that now. We're starting that pipeline with uh, our school project, our transportation school project, our workforce initiative now, or WIN LA pro uh, project or program. Uh, this is an emergency. It is a national emergency. And it's not that we do not have the pool of individuals, because we have returning veterans, um, we have uh, young people in DCFS system, we have people in the foster care system. We have the pool of individuals. How do we get them ready to fill these positions? That is one of our main focuses at Metro right now, along with community colleges to help us do that. Um, and, and I'll build on that as one of the contractors that Phil was mentioning. Um, we have manufacturing in LA County. We have 800 workers. We, we would we have the capacity to hire up to 1,200, and we absolutely have a challenge with finding qualified workers. We are committed to those same communities that, that Phil mentioned. We have a community benefits agreement, which is a legally binding document. We are the only electric bus manufacturer to have it, saying that we are going to hire from the communities in need, veterans, women, minorities. Um, we want to make sure these are good jobs. These are middle-class green wage jobs with huge opportunity here and nationwide but right now the burden is entirely on the private sector and you're getting people who have zero experience we need that backfill we need the community colleges we're working with the antelope valley community college district right now on training programs and apprenticeships we're working with our union to develop apprenticeship programs um, we need to be at the high school level we need you know real thinking about vocational training um, on our end we think electrification needs to be a key part of that as well and electrification and manufacturing and we're working there's more money now so there's some programs and a focus at the state level that recognizes that the, these new advanced technologies need that sort of training, but it requires really, really comprehensive partnerships to make sure that the kids and you know, and younger adults as well are able to get the training they need. We need help. You got a question? Now. Another question? This will be the last question. Yep. Go ahead.
what was the question? So the, the question, just to paraphrase, if I may, uh, is taking what we heard today in terms of moving mm. forward with the local bills that have passed and statewide bills and making sure that would you agree that we need to start doing these things of not having too wide or too narrow, but providing the opportunity for, I think, innovation and flexibility and, and really the step to encourage uh, the business and communities to uh, fully advance what was discussed today. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Next. Absolutely. We need, we need three more yeses. <laughs> so I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to add to that that I think it's important for the business community and for organizations and stakeholder organizations to always look towards progress and to make the steps that get us to a better place. And, you know, I'm reminded in a lot of debates I have with the environmental community about, you know, well, we hate natural gas and we only want electric and actually arguing against deploying something that reduces emissions by 90% for 10 years and getting nothing. And it just doesn't make sense. You don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We always have to pursue the good and, and strive to the per for the perfect. And, you know, uh, you know, I look at this, uh, we got into this transportation stuff to address uh, uh, emissions and, and that was really to help our customers um, and uh, when technology comes along that does a better job, then it takes over. That's how the world works. But let's not stop the good because we only want the perfect. And I think it's important for the business community to realize that in the legislature, at the agencies, there is a lot of dynamic uh, that stops progress and doesn't get us the outcomes we want because we have constituency groups that only want it this way and aren't accepting various ways of getting to whatever the outcome is. And this is true with CEQA reform, it's true with air quality, it's true with climate change, it's true with electric or natural gas, it's true in a lot of areas. Um, and I think that the business community needs to step up and Viking needs to step up and start playing a role that, that argues for progress and moving towards good outcomes and, and not being silent because the silence of the business community and large stakeholder organizations allows the perfect to stop the good. George, that's a great stopping point. Unfortunately, uh, this is all of the time we have for this panel, for which Parsons was proud to be a track sponsor along with our partner Metro. We also want to thank BYD America and all of our panelists here, so please give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Again, thank you for your time being here today. Uh,